We're going to open uh, Ms. Newsom's talk with the, the film's trailer, and then Jennifer will delve into how social media can ultimately flip mainstream media on its head to tell a different story about women and girls that should create lasting change for women and girls across America and throughout the world. So let's start with the trailer. The media is the message and the messenger, and increasingly a powerful one. In a world of a million channels, people try to do more shocking and shocking things to break through the clutter. They resort to violent images, or sexually offensive images, or demeaning images. When is it going to be enough? There is no appreciation for women intellectuals. It's all about the body, not about the brain. You all saw the uh, photo from the weekend of Hillary looking so haggard and what, looking like 92 years old. Breast implants, did they have them or not? If you waterboarded Nancy Pelosi, she wouldn't admit the plastic surgery. The fact that media are so derogatory to the most powerful women in the country. And what does it say about media's ability to take any woman in America seriously? I have close friends that would go to the bathroom and put on like 10 pounds of makeup, you know, when you're at school to learn. I remember in fifth grade, I was worrying about my weight, and now in ninth grade, I'm still worrying about my weight. As a culture, women are brought up to be fundamentally insecure. Media creates consciousness, and if what gets put out there that creates our consciousness is determined by men, we're not going to make any progress. Little boys and little girls when they're seven years old and equal number want to be president of the United States when they grow up. But then you ask the same question when they're 15 and you see this massive gap emerging. We're shortchanging voices that are urgently needed in public forums from ever getting to the table. As the most powerful country in the world, if you're not standing for the right values and the right principles, that's a loss for the world. You get a woman in the Oval Office, most powerful person in the world, what's the downside? You mean besides the PMS and the moon's weight? The media treats women like shit, and it's horrible, and it's like, I don't know how we survive it, I don't know how we rise above it. You can't be what you can't see. It's extremely important for women to be writing their own stories and giving them to people to really emotionally become impacted by. The media can be an instrument of change. It can awaken people and change minds. It depends on who's piloting the plane. Misrepresentation. Misrepresentation is more than a film. It's a social action campaign to empower women and girls and create lasting change in our culture. In a nutshell, the film suggests that if you can't see it, you can't be it. And if you can see it, you can be it. In other words, women and girls in particular need inspiration to see what they can become and to help them to achieve their potential. Now, inspiration can come from many places. Family, communities, education, sports, the arts. And I'm a big proponent of making sure that we empower women in all of those environments. However, studies show that given the role of media as this great pedagogical force of communication in our society, which is dictating cultural values and gender norms to us on a constant streaming basis, that media is teaching children on a daily basis that a woman's value lies in her youth, her beauty, and in her sexuality, and not in her capacity as a leader. In the olden days, stories were passed down to us from our parents, from family members, educational and community leaders, and they were about sharing experiences. Now the media, run predominantly by elder men as a capitalist construct, is our primary storyteller. So with media deregulation, the 24-7 media news cycle, 
infomercials, <laughs> reality TV, this celebrity tabloid culture that we all live in. And eyeballs, uh, this whole competition for eyeballs in the marketplace, media's main objective, which used to be education and information, what is now to sell to us. Specifically, media is trying to make women feel insecure and manipulate them into buying something, or it's sexualizing women so that men buy something. Scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, scary if you, like me, are concerned for the well-being of a future or young person in your life. I'm a big believer that you don't need to accept things about our culture that you don't want to. Culture is learned, and therefore it can be unlearned. This is really what I want to speak to you all about tonight, because the one thing this representation has taught me is that women are powerful and that women's voices need to be heard. And that one ordinary individual like myself, united with others around a meaningful, common goal, can take itty bitty small actions that ultimately lead to a revolution of sorts and create lasting change. So how do we start? We delve into media. Did you know that women are only 3% of media positions of clout? If you look at publishing, advertising, telecommunications, and entertainment, women are underrepresented in the top decision-making positions. In other words, 97% of what you know and learn about yourself on a regular basis is from the male perspective. Now I look around the room and I see quite a few men in the room, and believe me, this is not a male versus female thing. And I don't fault anyone in particular. What it is, though, is it's a call to action. Because here we are in America, this great democracy during the 21st century. Women are 51% of the population and we're 86% of consumers. And yet we remain underrepresented in probably the most powerful industry affecting our culture, the media. And don't get me started about women in politics. May I remind you that when, that when we do not represent women, it doesn't just hurt women, it hurts all of us. We limit the ideas and possibilities to make the world a better place. Think about it. How can media companies fully represent all the diversity and complexity of what it is to be a woman and what is important to women if there aren't enough women at the table speaking on behalf of women and influencing the decisions that are being made? Some stereotypes and practices, the proof of this lack of women behind the scenes, include a disproportionate representation of white, young, sexy, very skinny women, the hypersexualization of news anchors for ratings and profit, reality TV stereotypes, don't get me started there. And here's my favorite, Dr. Caroline Heldman, coined the uh, two most powerful uh, stereotypes or archetypes of women in TV and film as the bitchy boss and the fighting fuck toy. Go see misrepresentation to actually see what I'm talking about. On the personal front, I started out in Hollywood at the ripe old age of 28. Notice the sarcasm. When Hollywood starlets were tabloid fodder, you became famous for distributing a sex tape. I was told to take my Stanford MBA off my resume and to lie about my age. Well, I didn't do either, but I certainly uh, had my confidence shaken. As an actress, I was cast as a trophy wife and a dumb blonde. Stereotypes were the norm. And rarely were powerful female characters even available to audition for. When I complained to family and friends, they said, Jen, well, what are you thinking? It's Hollywood. <laughs> But I said, but shouldn't the media be reflecting reality? Shouldn't the media be reflecting our culture? And why is it that every time I go in for an audition, the character is required to take her clothes off? What most people don't realize is that the magnitude of objectification of women and the way objectification gets internalized both by men and women impedes girls and women from realizing their potential. Take it a step further, as feminist and lecturer Dr. Jean Kilborn says, 
Turning something into an object or a thing is almost the first step towards justifying violence against that thing. One in six women in our country have experienced rape or attempted rape. And one in four women, women are abused by a domestic partner in their lifetime. And I happen to fall into that stat. As a white, privileged, educated woman, I'm one of many. And truth be told, like many women, well, let me just share this one part. Um, I, I want to share these pervasive examples of the media's misrepresentations of women, its underrepresentations of women, and its impact on, on women in our culture to suggest that the mainstream media has been leading a cultural backlash against women, contributing to greater inequality and pitting women against each other. Now here's the good news. And I have a minute left. Okay. <laughs> Rather than being the problem, media can be the solution. As I said earlier, since culture is learned, culture can be unlearned. So while we work to get more women in the pipeline of leadership in media, social media may be our quickest path to, to transforming our culture. Think about it. Women are natural connectors. Together, we band and thrive. We take care of each other's families, and we help to create communities. And most of our if we were left in charge of the world, it would be a better place. When it comes to networking, we're already online. And we're in line, we're online in more spades than men. And so what's so great about social media is that if used properly, it gives people a safe place to share their voice, encourages positive peer pressure, and ultimately can affect positive change. Take Egypt, for example. Social media has been leading a democratic revolution of storytelling. And what is clear to me from this film is that women are dying to tell their stories. Just a little stat for you. Did you know that globally women's stories are only, comprise only 20% of news media out there? So what might happen if women and girls in the masses joined a movement to tell their stories? Using social media platforms, what if we all united around a common goal of story storytelling from a woman's perspective, as compared to a predominantly male perspective? And then what would happen if men of consciousness, men who respect women and treat them as their equals, joined women over another common goal of getting these women's stories into all forms of media, and we actually ignited a movement, one small strategic step at a time? And with each action, people became more excited and more confident that they individually and collectively could, could affect change. And the snowball effect occurred. And all of a sudden, we started seeing real changes in our culture, not just individually, but collectively, and perhaps even systemically. And now I'm in the negative. Can I keep, keep talking? I can't, can I? <laughs> can I? Because I'm jumping all over the place here. Here's what it could look like. Post women and men of all walks of life joining forces and collaborating on getting women's stories out there there are more female journalists writing stories about women and girls. There are more female writers and directors in Hollywood. And then you start to see more women in the pipeline. You see more women in the pipeline of media companies making decisions about the types of stories that are being told, the content, and the types of women you're seeing on screen. And more and more women are now seeing themselves reflected in the media, and they're inspired. Remember, if you can see it, you can be it. So we start seeing less insecurity in women and more confidence in women's abilities to aspire to great things. Imagine what the world would be like if women's focus on their youth, beauty, and sexuality became less of a daily focus, less of a handicap, and they cha channeled all that time, energy, and creativity into becoming leaders or making the world a better place. Simultaneously, what would happen if men started recognizing the value of women beyond their youth and youth and affection, and they actually started listening to women? And what if men really started investing in women? What if they started paying them what they pay men, helping them up the ladder, and giving them seats at the boardroom table? How about 50% of the seats? What would that be like? We all know that social movements have overthrown dictators and elected presidents. We also know social movements have put products and some companies out of business overnight. So how long does it take to change a culture? Some say 20 years. 
but using social media, what do we think? I'm confident that it's done strategically with clear and meaningful intentions and a lot of out-of-the-box creative thinking that we can start changing our culture right now. And this is what misrepresentation and its call to action campaign is all about. It's about using social media in three simple ways. And I will cut to the taste. Engage women and girls in finding their voice, telling their stories, and committing to small individual acts that ultimately can become bigger acts of change. Invite men and boys to join our movement and champion women and have them use social media as well. And ultimately, <laughs> connect people around a common, meaningful goal. And so, misrepresentation's responsibility is to provide the public with that call to action, that opportunity for change. You're seeing it with other documentary films. You saw it perhaps a little bit with An Inconvenient Truth and now with Race to Nowhere and Waiting for Superman. And this is our responsibility. Since Misrepresentation's film premiere at the Sundance Film Festival in 20, yeah, 2011, we've had over 1,200 requests for the film's screenings, both domestically and internationally. And we've done nothing to solicit those screenings, save show up at a few film festivals. Fortunately, the, the demand appears to grow exponentially as word gets out. Oprah Winfrey's network is broadcasting the, uh, the film in the fall. Local Films Inter uh, Educational is distributing the film to educational institutions. And we're just now launching our semi-theatrical campaign. I share that because film has such a great opportunity to invigorate movements, to be a catalyst for change. And I believe that we're going to be proof of that. Let me conclude with this, and I apologize for going over. The reason I'm confident that misrepresentation social movement is going to be successful is because it has meaning, is because it's fostering connectivity between individuals and communities. And ultimately, it's connected to something bigger, something bigger than all of us. It's going to be righting wrongs in our culture and ensuring equality and justice for all. I truly believe we're in the beginning of a new era where parity will be achieved and women's voices will be heard. And I can promise you this. I, an ordinary individual surrounded by like-minded ordinary individuals and organizations, are committed to this initiative for as long as it takes. And to steal a phrase from a dear friend and a woman that I admire, Donna Brazil, let me leave you with this. Why should you all join me in this movement? Because there's no one better. And why should you join me now? Because tomorrow is not soon enough. Thank you and good night.